Okay. Okay. Well, good evening. Um, this talk was originally called uh, Wilkie Collins More Than Dickens Mate, uh, but I've chosen More Than Dickens Ampersand because uh, this was the nickname the Victorians gave Collins, and you are obviously a more sophisticated audience. Uh, it is for his close relationship with Dickens that Collins is best known, even today. But as I'll argue tonight, there's much more to Wilkie Collins than the second fiddle he undoubtedly played to the inimitable Boz. Now, why is that moving? Oh, there we go. He was born 12 years after Dickens on January 1824 and outlived him by 19 years, dying in 1889 at the age of 65, so living seven years longer than his more famous friend and mentor. And this is what Dickie, uh, Wilkie Collins looked like, uh, so that you know who we're talking about. When you see him with a, a bushy beard, uh, he looks um, uh, like an Old Testament prophet, doesn't he? Even with the glasses, um, particularly that one. But he didn't always have a beard. There was a time if I can go back, there was a time when uh, he didn't have a beard, and this is an 1850 portrait by John Everett Millay, a lifelong friend. Um, here he's 26 years old. He was short, only five foot six, and oddly built with a head too big for his body, small hands, and very poor eyesight. On his forehead, he had a notable protuberance. He was unable to stay still, and like Dickens, liked to dress flamboyantly in colourful waistcoats when he wasn't at home in his dressing gown. Yes, Wilkie Collins looked distinctly strange, but he was nonetheless a charmer, befriended by the great, loved by children, and irresistibly attractive to women. In his day, he was as popular as Dickens and equally well paid for his work. I've decided to, to divide this into six sections, uh, six ages, if you like. Uh, so let's begin with his um, earliest years. This 1833 picture of Wilkie Collins is by the Scottish portrait painter Andrew Geddes when he was nine years old. And this is uh, where he's born, at 11 New Cavendish Street in Marylebone, in the centre of London, on the 8th of January, 1824, within walking distance of the British Museum to the east and Regent's Park to the north. This was the area in which he lived more or less continuously for the next 65 years. His father, William, was a noted landscape painter and member of the Royal Academy, whose paintings had been bought by the Prince Regent and later by Dickens. His mother, Harriet Geddes, was the daughter of an impoverished army lieutenant, but her sister, Margaret Sarah Carpenter, was a successful portrait painter, as was her cousin, Andrew Geddes, whom we've already met. Like his father, she was a strict evangelical Anglican. They were married in Edinburgh. William was called after his father, but was always known by his second name, Wilkie, which he got from his godfather, the Scottish painter David Wilkie. The character of the aptly named Miss Clack, whom he satirises mercilessly in the Moonstone, can be seen as a direct result of his resentment at his parents' excessive religiosity and his evangelical upbringing. Two years later, his brother Charles Alston Collins was born. His second name again came from that of another painter, the American Washington Alston, with whom his father had visited Paris in 1817. Charles was born in Hampstead, where the family for two years lived between 1828 and 1830. Both children were educated at home with the Europe to Maida Hill Academy for Wilkie Collins when he was 11. However, he then traveled with his parents to the continent where his father could pursue his painting career in France and Italy. This is a later painting by William Collins from 1841 of the scene from the caves of Ulysses at Sorrento, though no doubt he went there as a child as well. The 12-year-old Wilkie Collins learned to speak French and Italian and would become fluent in both. It would seem to have been an ideal childhood, such as that experienced by the children in these genre paintings by his father, despite his strict religious upbringing. The happiness would end, however, on his return to England. Wilkie Collins, now 14, was sent to the Reverend Cole's private boarding school in Highbury. Here he was bullied by a boy who would beat him with a cat and nine tails if he displeased him. 
and would force Wilkie to tell him a story every night. Like Scheherazade and the Arabian Nights, it saved him from further beatings and honed the storytelling talent for which he would later become famous. Thankfully, his ordeal only lasted for two years. <clears throat> before, just before his 17th birthday, his father found him in employment as an apprenticed clerk to Atrobus and Company, a firm of tea merchants in the Strand. His father had proposed sending him to the University of Oxford with a view to his entering the church. But as Collins himself said, I found no vocation for that way of life and I preferred trying mercantile pursuits. He spent five years there, but although he found the clerical work tedious, the work was not demanding and he managed to escape from the office frequently, including two months with his father on a painting tour to Scotland and the Shetland Islands in the summer of 1842. Edmund Atropos's generosity may be down to the fact that young Wilkie was being paid very little, if anything, for this experience. It should be noted, of course, that it was during this time that tea and opium were inextricably linked in the China trade, and a war fought, 1839-42, to force, the Ch force China to accept opium in exchange for tea. Opium would play a big part in Collins' life. It was during this time, also, that he began writing much influenced by Sir Walter Scott and Sir Edward Bulwer Lytton. His first novel was Ayolani, or Tahiti, written in 1844 to 1845. It's about love and tragedy in the Pacific, but with a smattering of child sacrifice thrown in. Despite being sent to several publishers, it was rejected and not published until 1999. A year earlier, though, the 19-year-old had had a haunting ghost story lamenting the end of stagecoach travel with the arrival of the railways. The Last Coachman, published in the Illustrated Magazine, the first of several gothic tales he would publish in his lifetime. He was, however, successful in getting his next novel published in 1850. It's called Antonia, and some love stories set in 5th century Rome when the Goths were at the gates. He was 26 years old. 1846, the year in which he began the novel, was also the year in which, under pressure from his father, he abandoned the tea company to train as a lawyer at Lincoln's Inn. He qualified, but never actually practised at any time during his life. Though his novels are full of the minutiae of the law, as you might expect from a lawyer, and Mr Dawson Barrister later became a useful alias. The death of William Collins's father in February 1847, at the age of 58, however, interrupted his novel writing career. Out of respect for his father, Collins paused in his writing of Antonia. Instead, he wrote his father's biography entitled Memoirs of the Life of William Collins, Collins R.A. Esquire. It was published in two volumes in November 1848 to wide acclaim and was much more successful than anything he had written previously. Now then might be an appropriate time to look at the importance of the world of art in the life of Wilkie Collins. His father had wanted his son to become an artist rather than a writer. Now, William Collins could number among his friends both Wordsworth and, and Coleridge. Throughout his life then, the author was surrounded by art and artists. This was the milieu in which he grew up. We can call this his second age. As I mentioned already, he was named after his godfather, the renowned Scottish genre and royal portrait painter and intimate friend of William Collins, Sir David Wilkie R.A., shown here in a self-portrait on the right-hand side, I should say. He was born in 1785 and died in 1841. And the other two paintings are of David Wilkie's house in Kensington, so he's quite well off, and of King George IV on his first visit to Scotland in 1822. Uh, needless to say, it's a, a diplomatically flattering and slimmed down representation of the king as Walter Scott, the organiser of this uh, Scottish jamboree, uh, would have wished. Wilkie Collins' brother, on the other hand, was named after another painter, the American Washington Alston, with whom William Collins had visited Paris in 1817. He was born in 1779 and died in 1843, and is shown here in self-portrait. Uh, this is Alston's painting of Shakespeare's The Taming of the Shrew and of Elijah in the Desert, but obviously influenced by the dramatic American landscapes 
for which he became famous. And this, on the top right-hand corner, is William Collins, Colin, Wilkie Collins' father. He'd been born in 1788, had exhibited every year at the National Academy from 1807 to 1848, and was made a full Royal Academician in 1820. In 1818, he had even sold a painting to the Prince Regent. He had made his name with sentimental scenes, detailed landscapes, and idealised pictures of the rural poor, as in this picture painted in 1846. It's entitled Troma Early Morning. And Ruskin, on the bottom right there, said of it, I have never seen the oppression of sunlight in a clear, lurid, rainy atmosphere, more perfectly or faithfully rendered, and the various portions of reflected and scattered light are all studied with equal truth and solemn feeling. I think he liked it. And this is another one. This is uh, uh, an equally sentimentalised landscape of the gypsy camp. And here, uh, on the left, the sale of the pet lamb, the painting that made William Collins famous in 1812. It, it sold for 140 guineas. That's the painting, not the lamb, by the way. And on the other side, returning from the haunts of the sea fowl from 1833. Both very accomplished, but characteristically idealised and sentimental uh, genre paintings. William uh, Wilkie Collins did also try his hand at painting and did have a painting exhibited at the Royal Academy in 1849 called The Smuggler's Retreat, which I've not been able to find a copy of, I'm afraid. But it was his brother Charles who would carry on the family's name in the world of art. Charles Alston Collins had been accepted into the Royal Academy schools at the age of 19 and showed some talent. On the left is Charles' chalk drawing of his father from 1846, and in the middle, a portrait of his brother Wilkie from 1853. The portraits on the right, though, are of Charles Austin Collins in 1850, when he was 22, and 1852, when he was 24. They were drawn by the pre-Raphaelite artists John Everett Millet and William Holman Hunt, with whom Wilkie would also form a lifelong friendship. Throughout his life, Charles, mixed twin members of the pre-Raphaelites, uh, was proposed as a member, but was never formally accepted. The medievalism and attention to detail favoured by the pre-Raphaelites is evidenced by his first painting to be exhibited, the peddler of Berengaria's alarm for the safety of her husband, Richard the Lionheart, in 1850. According to legend, Richard's wife recognised her husband's belt being offered for sale and when he had, uh, when he had gone missing. On the tapestry in the background, which I don't really think you see very clear, on the tapestry on the background, we see Joseph's brothers offering the coat of many colours for sale in the biblical story. Allegory and symbolism were, of course, another characteristic of pre-Raphaelite paintings. Uh, his next painting, Convent Thoughts, was painted between 1850 and 51. This reflects his increasing ascetic and religiously introspective state of mind at the time. He fell in love with Dante Gabriel Rossetti's sister, Maria, but she rejected him and to, uh, chose to join the convent instead. Many of Collins' works are devotional in nature, including the picture of the devout childhood of, uh, childhood of Elizabeth of Hungary and lost love, shown here. And this is The Good Harvest, a year later in 1854, with its characteristically pre-Raphaelite bright lighting, vivid colours and attention to detail. Charles Collins was less successful with his landscapes, and a landscape of Regent's Park called May was panned by the critics. Late in the 1850s, he abandoned art and devoted himself to writing as a career, producing most notably some humorous essays and art criticism. In July 1860, he married Dickens' youngest daughter, Kate, but it wasn't a very successful marriage and was never consummated. Charles was most likely a homosexual at a time when that could not be admitted. Here is Kate in 1860, on the left, newly engaged to Charles Alston Collins and the model for John Everett Millet's famous painting of the Black Brunswicker. And in the middle, Kate and Charles are seen here together with Dickens on the steps of Dickens' house at Gads Hill in 1862. 
The others here are Mamie Dickens, Georgina Hogarth and H.F. Chorley. Dickens commissioned his son-in-law to illustrate the mystery of Edwin Drood in 1870, uh, but Collins fell ill soon after completing the cover, which is shown here. Kate would later go on to have a much more successful marriage with the Italian-born English artist Carlo Perugini. Another artist whose story is intertwined with that of Wilkie Collins is the most successful female artist of her day, Henrietta Ward, 1832 to 1924. She had first met the artist Edward Matthew Ward, uh, 1816 to 79, uh, no relation, as a child. He was best known for his later work painting historical murals in the House of Commons, and over time a friendship had developed, although it had been, has to be said, he was at the time twice her age. Collins was a friend of the artist, and in May 1848 helped him to elope with her, even though this meant she was subsequently disinherited. She was not yet 16. They later informed the plot of his 1852 novel, Basil, which Collins would dedicate to Edward's elder brother, Charles, and more specifically, the 1871 novella, Mrs. or Miss. The wards would have eight children, and it was reported to be a contented marriage, though Edward did end his own life in 1879 with a rusty razor following a period of depression. Henrietta outlived her husband by 45 years. They specialised in historical and genre paintings. Here on the left, the Princess, Princes in the Tower, 1861, by Henrietta Ward, and on the right, King Lear and Cordelia, 1857, by Edward Matthew Ward. The Wards were part of the Dickens Circle, and another artist who was part of that group was Augustus Leopold Egg. He was also a friend of Wilkie Collins, and through him, Dickens and Collins would first meet. As a painter, he was best known for his moral and social activism, for exposing the reality beneath the veneer of Victorian respectability. As such, he covered much of the same ground that Dickens had covered and Collins would cover in the future. Here, for example, this is triptych on the subject of the fallen woman. They are full of symbols. In the top left hand of the frame is the discovery of the woman's adultery with the house of cards and broken apple in the background. Beneath that is the scene after the man has died and two children now grown older look out over the rooftops with the final image of the same night sky over the fallen woman, a child's leg sticking out from beneath her. Uh, and apparently abandoned. This, this set of pictures was exhibited at the Royal Academy in 1858 with no title, but with the subtitle, August the 4th, I've just heard that B has been dead more than a fortnight, so his poor children have now lost both parents. I hear she was seen on Friday last near the Strand, evidently without a place to lay her head. What a fall hers has been. I think I've probably heard um, catchier titles than that. Augustus Egg, like Collins, was involved in amateur dramatics. He was at that time acting with Dickens' amateur dramatic company, who were performing Bulwer Lytton's play, Not So Bad As We Seem. Collins was recruited to join them, and so it was that Collins joined the Dickens Circle. We can take this from when Dickens wrote to him on the 4th of March, 1851, and then eight days later, when they met for the first time on the 12th of March, and so to our third age. So Dickens and Wilkie Collins, one of the closest friendships and literary partnerships in the history of English literature. For a time, the inimitable became the inseparable. Interestingly, there's an exhibition at the Dickens Museum in Doughty Street, London, which begins later this month on the 15th of November, which is entitled Mutual Friends, The Adventures of Charles Dickens and Wilkie Collins. It will run until the 25th of February, 2024, and marks the bicentenary of Collins' birth. In the May following their first meeting, Collins took part in the first of a series of dramatic performances. First of all, at Devonshire House, where Dickens lived, and then on tour with him. By 1857, when this photograph was taken at the home of Dickens' solicitor, Collins was firmly embedded in the Dickens circle. Here lying down is Dickens, kneeling is Collins, and standing up is Augustus Egg, who had once proposed to Georgina Hogarth, Dickens' sister-in-law, who's also seated there somewhere. 
Like Collins, Dickens had long been an aficionado of both the theatre and amateur dramatics. Here Dickens was playing the part of Bobadil in Johnson's Every Man in His Humour in 1845, and on the right, painted by Augustus Egg, when playing the part of Sir Charles Coldstream, the hero of a farce called Used Up in 1852. Collins also appeared and toured with Dickens as far afield as Liverpool. Uh, the words, um, ah, Mr Dickens, it was a sad loss to the public when you took the writing, were spoken by the stage carpenter at the Haymarket Theatre. Collins' first performance for Dickens' troupe of players was then in a five-act comedy written by Bulwer Lytton and entitled Not So Bad As We Seem, also performed in front of Queen Victoria. Ostensibly, it was um, uh, to raise money for the Guild of Art and Literature, a charitable trust set up for impoverished actors and artists, but really it was just Dickens and his friends having a bit of fun. As evidence here, as with previous plays, this one also toured. And when they went to Liverpool, the local newspaper, the Liverpool Mercury, reported hijinks at the Adelphi Hotel at the after show party and even drew a picture to illustrate it. Uh, the bearded man is more likely to be George MacDonald, a Scottish author, rather than Collins, but, but he was definitely there. Collins shared more than a love of theatre with Dickens. He was also a great traveller, though had already also in 1851 published an account of a walking tour of Cornwall that he'd undertaken with an artist friend called Henry Brandling. Rambles Beyond Railways was so called because at the time Cornwall didn't have any railways, and so it's intended to be a joke. In 1853, Collins stayed with Dickens in Boulogne and then toured Switzerland and Italy with Dickens and Augustus Egg for three months. Visits to Paris alone with Dickens followed in February 1855 for a month and February 1856 for six weeks. It is pretty certain they, that, that they did more there than fly kites. They were reputed to have enjoyed flying kites, on their, particularly on their nocturnal tours together, as there are some pretty obvious clues in their letters. Collins did have a re reputation for living a rogue's life, the title of one of his later novels. What they had most in common, though, was that they were both writers. By 1851, Dickens had published eight novels and was in the process of writing Bleak House for serialization in 1852. Collins was the coming man. As well as his life with William Collins and his travel log about Cornwall, Collins had only published one novel, Antonia. But in November 1852, his second novel, Basil, a novel about elopement based on that of Edward and Margaret Ward mentioned above, was published by Bentley. It would open a floodgate of novel writing, which he would continue all his life. Collins wrote 30 novels to Dickens' 15, though Dickens is clearly the better author, at least I think so. It was only a matter of time then before Collins would find his work serialised in Dickens' weekly journal, Household Words, and later in All the Year Round. In April 1852, Collins' gothic tale of a, a terribly strange bed, as in Poe's The Pit and the Pendulum, The Instrument of Death Descends from the Ceiling, was published in Household Words. In so doing, the first police officer was introduced into English fiction. Although Dickens rejected another macabre tale, Mad Monkton, on the grounds of taste, uh, he didn't think hereditary madness was a fitting theme for a family magazine. Dickens was soon eager to publish other works by his new friend. Hide and Seek, with a dead mute heroine, was dedicated Dick to Dickens as a token of admiration and affection, and was again published by Bentley's in 1854. But his next two novels were serialised in Household Words, A Rogue's Life between February and April, appropriately when Dickens and Collins were exploring the bordels of Paris, and The Dead Secret, serialised in 1857. In October 1856, Collins had joined the staff of Household Words and began collaboration with Dickens on the short story The Wreck of the Golden Mary in the journal's Christmas edition. It was a rare honour. When in 1859 Household Words was abandoned by Dickens after Bradbury and Evans refused to print the violated letter, 
his personal statement blaming Catherine, uh, his wife, for their divorce, Collins followed him to his new publication all the year round. To his credit, Collins did not break off relations with Catherine, as those in the Dickens circle had been urged to do, but many did. All the year round was also to serialise three of the four novels uh, in Collins' middle period and recognised as his best. The Woman in White from November 1859 to August 1860, No Name from March 1863 to June, and The Moonstone from January to August 1868. By 1863, Collins' earnings had topped £10,000 more than any other 19th century novelist in a single year, including Dickens. That's more than one and a half million in today's terms. I'll return to these uh, uh, four novels later. The fourth one, not illustrated, is called Armadale. Many of his novels were also turned into plays. It was one of the methods writers used to protect, protect copyright. But in addition, Collins also wrote plays both for and with Dickens. His play, No Thoroughfare, for example, was co-written with Dickens and published in the 1867 Christmas number of All the Year Round. It was dramatised at the Adelphi Theatre on December 26th and underwent a run of 200 performances before it went on tour. The tense psychological drama The Lighthouse, set in the Eddystone Lighthouse, his first play, had been written by Collins in 1855 and was performed by Dickens' theatrical company, with Dickens and Collins in the cast, and was still being performed nearly 20 years later. It was, however, the play that he and Dickens had cooperated on 10 years earlier, which would have the biggest impact on Dickens' personal life and the story of their friendship. The failed Art Arctic expedition of 1846, led by Sir John Franklin, represented here in a uh, in an 1864 painting by Lancia, had once again made the news with the reported discovery of some bones in the pack ice and the suggestion by the Inuit who had discovered them that there was evidence of cannibalism. Dickens was scandalised by this slur on the English character and by indigenous people at that and set out with Collins to write a tale of boys' own daring do to show these men as British heroes. The result of that play was The Frozen Deep, written in 1856. This was first performed in Tavistock House, where Dickens was then living, with the cast shown here. He used not only his troupe of actors, but family members as well. His children, Charlie, Mamie and Katie, and his sisters-in-law, Helen and Georgina Hogarth. He took the lead role of Richard Wardour, while Collins played Frank Aldersley, his rival in love and the other main male protagonist. It was performed in Tavistock House in January and then in front of Queen Victoria, Prince Albert and guests at the Gallery of Illustration in London. So successful had the play been that it was inevitable that it would go on tour. It duly did so, and after further performances in London, it moved to a venue which could cater for larger audience. This was the Free Trade Hall in Manchester for three performances in August 1857. It would, of course, not have been seemly for Dickens' own daughters to appear on stage in public, and so a family of professional actors was hired to take their place. These were the Turnans. Mrs. Turner, her eldest daughter Maria, and fatefully, the 18-year-old Helen Turnan. Dickens was smitten. He found an excuse the following month to go off on a jaunt to the Lake District with Wilkie Collins. Collins fell into a water course on Carrot Fell and sprained his ankle. Ostensibly, he was to continue research in a book of journalistic and light-hearted prose together, which has subsequently published as the lazy tour of two idle apprentices. Dickens was Francis Goodchild and Collins was Thomas Seidel. It was, however, being used as a cover for Dickens, with Collins in tow to meet up with Ellen Turner again, this time at the Doncaster races. And this he did. From then on, his marriage with Catherine was doomed, and within a year he divorced her. His secret liaisons with Helen, Ellen Turner 
his kept mistress continued to the end of his life. In 1857, both Dickens and Collins resigned from the Garrick Club after falling out with Thackeray, after rumours emerged about the affair. It would also have something to do uh, with the criticism of their friend uh, Edmund Yates. It caused a rift between Dickens and Thackeray, which would last for years. Collins then was in the know about Dickens' relationship with Ellen Turner from the very beginning. He did, as I've said, continue to keep good relations with Catherine Dickens, but his relationship with Dickens may have cooled somewhat after this affair. It was not Collins, though, who was being judgmental, but a combination of Dickens' annoyance with his son-in-law, Charles Collins, and disapproval of Collins' bohemian lifestyle. Though They would continue to meet and collaborate until Dickens' death in 1870. It's now then perhaps time to look at Collins' own relationships with women, where double identities played a bigger part in his life as in his fiction. And so to phase four. Many women in Victorian England were alarmed when the expansion of literacy and the growth of the lending libraries meant that women had greater access to fiction. Fiction could excite their passions, stimulate their imaginations, and give them ideas above their station. By the end of the century, the phenomenon of the new woman was seen as an existential threat to a Victorian society based on patriarchy. Fiction might also suggest that behind the respectability of middle-class lives, there might lurk shocking secrets. Had the husbands of these new readers known of the life of Wilkie Collins, they would have even have been even more alarmed. 1859 was the year in which Wilkie Collins first serialized The Woman in White in all the year round. It was a phenomenal success. It was also the year that Collins moved out from his mother Harriet's house and set up house with Caroline Graves, the woman who was to be his common law wife far three years for the rest of his life. This painting of the somnambulist is by John Everett Millet, whose son told the tale of his walking one night with Charles and Wilkie Collins, only to be accosted by a woman dressed in white flowing robes, escaping from a villa in Regent's Park, where she'd been kept prisoner under mesmeric influence. It was believed that this woman was Caroline Graves. The closeness of this description to the dramatic opening of Collins' most famous novel goes without saying. Their first meeting, however, is likely to have been earlier in 1856 and, and less prosaic. Caroline Graves was a carpenter's daughter and a widow who originally came from Gloucestershire. She already had a young daughter called Elizabeth Harriet, who was always called Carrie, and who Wilkie Collins treated as his own daughter. He paid for her education in a private girls' boarding school and would protect her all his life. Caroline had come from a humble family and kept a small shop in the neighbourhood where he lived, and this is no doubt where they met. As someone who did not believe in the institu institution of marriage, Wilkie Collins was never going to marry her. He did give her affection and somewhere to live from 1856. And there she is pictured on the left. By 1859, Wilkie Collins, Caroline Graves and her daughter Carrie were living together in, in 124 Albany Street and then from May to December here at 22 Cavendish Street. They would continue to share a house together with one brief interlude in various well-established locations until the end of his life. Many regarded her simply as his bachelor housekeeper, though in the 1861 census, census he listed her as his wife. Nevertheless, the stigma of suspicion would have meant that they would have been shunned by polite society, and Carrie would never have been allowed to mix with the children of her betters. It's not surprising then that the plight of the fallen woman would have occupied much of Collins' fictions as the titles of these three later novels, The New Madeline, 1873, Magdalene, uh, Magdalene was of course a reformed prostitute, The Fallen Leaves, 1879, uh, dedicated to Caroline, and Jezebel's Daughter, uh, uh, 1880, indicate. Jezebel's Daughter was originally a play called The Red File, it was about a poisoning, but it was so bad, it was laughed off the stage. 
The one interlude in their relationship occurred in 1868. On October the 29th, Wilkie Collins sat in her pew at St. Marylebone's Parish Church and watched Caroline Graves marry another man called Joseph Clough, the 23-year-old son of a prosperous London distiller. It was, however, not a success, and in 1871, she left her husband of three years to return to Wilkie Collins at Gloucester Place. But what could have prompted this first break with Collins? The reason was that Collins had found another woman, Martha Rudd, possibly as early as 1864. Martha was one of eight children of an impoverished shepherd and his wife, who at the age of 16, when Wilkie first met her, was working as a servant or barmaid at the local inn in the coastal village of Winterton. He had travelled to Norfolk to research the area of Norfolk Broads for his 1864 novel, Armadale. In what uh, has been described as his idiosyncratic, if caring, sense of responsibility, he swept her off her feet and installed her in a house in London, a few minutes' walk from the house he shared with Caroline Graves and her teenage daughter, 17-year-old Carrie. His, his adopted uh, daughter, his devoted adopted daughter, had stayed with him when, when her mother had married and acted as his secretary. Uh, as it uh, coincidentally did um, his mother-in-law or, or, or Carrie's mother, uh, or um, Caroline's mother. Rather than trading in his old wife for a new mod model, he decided to keep both. And Martha uh, was soon pregnant and gave him children, two daughters and a son, Marion, known as Totty, in 1869, Harriet Constance, known as Hetty, in 1871, and William Charles in 1874. They took the name of Dawson, which Wilkie shared when he was with them. He became William Dawson, barrister at law. It was an arrangement that he somehow made to work, even taking both families on holiday, holiday to Ramsgate, with the two households installed in neighbouring boarding houses. The children would play together, though it said, though it seems unlikely, that Caroline and Martha never met. At least Dickens only kept one mistress. And so to life after Dickens, Wilkie Collins A.D. On the 9th of June, 1870, Dickens died at Gads Hill. By then, his relationship with his fellow author had cooled, but had not grown cold. Collins, for instance, travelled to Liverpool in 1867 for Dickens' Bon Voyage party before he set off to America. And Collins, of course, attended the funeral one of only 14 official mourners permitted. Yet, after Dickens' death, he was not unsparing in his criticism of Dickens as a writer, calling, for example, Edwin Drood, Edwin Drood the melanch melancholy work of a worn-out brain, and of the latter half of Dombey and Son, no intelligent person can have read without astonishment at the badness of it. In a, that was it in an annotated copy of Foster's Life of Dickens, now lost, and um, for which the uh, Dickens Museum will give you a fortune if you come across it. Collins continued to write novels, but critics suggest that his increasing pursuit of social causes in his novels does detract from their quality. He did also have attempts to, to overcomplicate his plots. Man and Wife, published in 1870, deals with the intricacies of the Irish and Scottish marriage laws, and in particular, the restrictions on, on women owning property. It wasn't until the, the Married Woman's Property Act of 1882 that this is issue was finally addressed. Poor Miss Finch, published in 1872, has a central character who is blind and is pursued by two twin brothers, uh, one of whose skin turns permanently blue as a result of taking medicine, silver nitrate, for epilepsy. Collins' fiction is notable for the number of characters who have to meet physical challenges, much like himself, perhaps. The Law and the Lady is an 1875 detective novel which deals with the Scottish legal verdict of not proven and gives us the first female detective in a novel, as well as Misery Dexter, a demented villain who resembles both a tiger and a monkey and who was born without legs. Following in Dickens' footsteps, Collins undertook a tour of the United States and Canada between September 1873 and March 1874. 
Here he met both Oliver Wendell Holmes and Mark Twain and posed in a fur coat for a series of photographs in New York by the famous American photographer Napoleon Cerrone, with whom he also struck up a friendship. He also visited a polygamous commune in Wallingford, Connecticut, and was full of its praises. One of his most popular works of fiction in the 1870s was his novella, The Haunted Hotel, serialized in the Belgravia magazine between June and November 1878, hot on the heels of Thomas Hardy's The Return of the Native, which was serialized between January and December. Collins' Gothic horror story is set in the city of Venice and takes place in an ancient palazzo converted into a modern hotel. There's a curious moment when the heroine sees a disembodied, blood-stained head descending from the ceiling. Does he like things coming down from the ceiling in his uh, Gothic st uh, stories? By now, though, his literary powers were waning, as was his eyesight. And although he remained popular and continued to write didactic novels on social issues, Heart and Science on Vivisection in 1882, The Evil Genius in 1885 on Divorce and Child Custody, and The Legacy of Cain in 1888 on The Fallacy of Inherited Evil, his genius had waned. His final novel, Blind Love, set in the Irish land wars of the 1880s and involving a woman's love for a member of a secret society of Irish assassins, was completed by Walter Besant, a historian, novelist and friend after the author's death, using the detailed notes that Collins had left behind. Interestingly, Collins had earlier refused to complete Dickens' unfinished novel, The Mystery of Edwin Drood. One of the major causes of Wilkins, Wil Collie, Wilkie Collins' decline and death was his opium addiction. He'd been plagued by illness all his life, with the agonies of neuralgia and rheumatic gout attacking different parts of his body, particularly his eyes. He was, for instance, unable to attend his mother's funeral in 1868, when he suffered his most severe attack. He tried numerous cures throughout his life, but always returned to laudanum. Now, laudanum was everywhere in Victorian England, from uh, Batley's sedative solution to Mother Bailey's quietening syrup, which you would give to your children. Small doses of opium increased in doses until he was taking daily what was described as more than enough to kill off a ship's crew or company of soldiers. He took so much laudanum whilst writing, writing The Moonstone in 1868 that his eyes looked like bags of blood. As a consequence, his grip on reality diminished, so that, for instance, he regularly imagined a green woman with tusks preying on him and ghosts wrestling with him at his writing desk. His opium addiction may be one of the wedges that came between him and Dickens. He died of a paralytic stroke at 82 Wimpole Street on the 23rd of September, 1889. Caroline was there beside him, but many visitors took her again to be no more than his housekeeper. He was buried five days later in Kensal Green Cemetery, coincidentally not very far from Anthony Trollope. The funeral was organised by Caroline Graves, and it's now thought that Martha Rudd and her children were also there, though for a long time it said they weren't. Caroline Graves tended his grave until her own death in 1893. Uh, she, she died in South End and was buried with, sorry, Caroline Graves tended his grave until her own death in 1893, and she was buried with him in Kensal Green Cemetery. Martha Rudd took over this role after Caroline's death and died herself in 1919. She died in South End. They never remarried. His last will and testament shocked Victorian society by dividing his state equally between his two mistresses, Caroline Graves and Martha Rudd. He treated them identically and unambiguously acknowledging and providing for his children. It was not to end happily, however, because Carrie's husband, Henry Powell Bartley, one of the trustees of Collins' estate, made off with the bulk of the money, leaving little for Caroline, Carrie or her children, and sadly nothing left to pass down to Martha Rudd. And so we come to the final phase of the Collins story, his legacy. What then was Wilkie Collins' legacy? Well, first of all, he left a huge body of Victorian writing. In the 65 years of his life, he wrote 30 novels, more than 60 short stories, 
at least 14 plays, a travel log, and more than 100 pieces of non-fiction, including many collaborations with Dickens. And that is a pretty prolific output. He's best known for only two novels, with two more which have stood the test of time, all written in the 1860s, when he rivaled Dickens for popularity and was at one time the wealthiest novelist of his day. It was Collins who frequently used, even if he didn't invent it, the threefold nuggets of advice for any writer, make him laugh, make him cry, and make him wait. If many of his novels are great baggy monsters, they still have moments of humour, pathos and suspense, which can still move and intrigue us today. These are his four novels which have stood the test of time. The Woman in White, No Name, Armadale and The Moonstone. So I'll begin by taking each in turn. The Woman in White was first serialised in all the year round between November 1859 and August 1860 and was an immediate success selling over 100,000 copies in serial form. The first instalment appeared on the same page as the last instalment of A Tale of Two Cities. Gladstone said that it had kept him up, up all night as he didn't wish to put it down. Collins always said that his tombstone would say, author of The Woman in White, and so it was. It's a novel of multiple narrators, each presenting their evidence as they would in a court of law. It's the story of a young art teacher, Walter Hartwright, who after meeting a strange woman dressed in white, a fugitive from a mental hospital with a dark secret on a road in Hampstead, gets drawn into unravelling the cunning scheme by a pair of Victorian villains. The scheming and delectably evil Count Fosco, surely the original Bond villain, and the unscrupulous fortune hunter and beautifully named Sir Percival Glyde to defraud a wealthy heiress, Laura Fairley. It is a strong female detective role for Marion Halcombe, the half-sister of the victim who the author describes thus. This is her first appearance. She left the window and I said to myself, the lady is dark. She moved her forward a few steps and I said to myself, the lady is young. She approached nearer and I said to myself, with a sense of surprise which words fail me to express, the lady is ugly. His novels often give a voice to those regarded at the margins of society, and Marion Halkin plays a pivotal role. The novel started a Victorian craze for all things woman in white, bonnets, shawls, toiletries, for example, which spread into the world of art. Here is Frederick, Frederick Walker's life-size 1871 poster art for the dramatization of the novel showing Anne Catterick throwing open a church door to step out into a graveyard at night. Then some early photographic art from 1862, Isabella, her daughter, by Clementina, Lady Howarden. And then the 1871 painting by Jean Everett Millet, called The Somnambulist, that we've seen already. And then there's Frederick Sandy's Gentle Spring from 1865, James McNeil Whistler's Symphony in White, uh, uh, number one, The White Girl, 1862, and a slide later as 1904 with Gustav Klimt's portrait of Hermine Gallina. Artists, of course, also reacted to each other. It was the same dichotomy between the female as goddess or fallen woman, which Collins had first made play of in his novel. And the art historians may think I'm pushing a bit, but why not also one of my favourite paintings, the Lady of Shalott by uh, John uh, William Waterhouse of 1888. And while we're on the roll, who can argue that Wilkie Collins' Woman in White did not also influence Dickens in his creation of Miss Havisham in his 1865 novel, Great Expectations? As well as influencing a movement in the world of art, Collins is also regarded as the founding father of the sensation novel following the success of The Woman in White. Novels such as East Lynn by Ellen Wood, serialised from January 1860 to 61. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens from December 1860 to August 1861. And Lady Audley, Audley's Secret by Mary Braddon between July and September 1861, followed hot on the heels of The Woman in White. Even the great Thomas Hardy joined in with his first published novel, Desperate Remedies, 
published in three volumes in 1872, acknowledging his debt to the sensation novels of Wilkie Collins. With a murder, a bigamy, suicide, a lesbian relationship, and a body in a bread oven, it was definitely sensational. The term was used pejoratively by most critics at the time to refer to fiction that was intentionally designed to jolt its readers strongly, affecting their nerves and sensations. There's an obvious overlap with Gothic fiction from which it emerged here as well. And significantly, Bram Stoker acknowledged the influence of the woman in white on the, his most famous novel, Dracula. Such was the success of the woman in white, Dickens was keen to serialize Collins' next novel, entitled No Name, in all the year round. So it was that it was serialized between the 15th of March, 1862, 62, and the 17th of June, 1863. The topic of children born out of wedlock and thereby having no name and no right to inherit was obviously something that concerned Collins in his personal life as well as in his fiction at this time. As in The Woman in White, it gives a strong leading role to a female character. Madeline and Nora Vanstone are left orphaned uh, by the sudden and unexpected deaths of their parents. And while the elder sister Nora accepts a lot, the younger, Madeline or Magdalene Vanstone is no angel in the house. Comfrey Patmore's poem had come out in 1862, but fights to retrieve her, her inheritance using all sorts of subterfuge. She is seen here contemplating suicide in Millet's illustration for the novel at the bottom right hand corner. She dresses up as, a, as an actress, or she's an actress who dresses up as other characters. It does have a colourful Victorian con man in Horatio Rag. Mrs. Rag is gentle giant of a slow-witted wife, one of many characters throughout Collins fiction with disabilities, something with which he could no doubt identify. A nasty scheming housekeeper and a milksop Victorian villain in the cousin who inherited the fortune and whom she tries to marry. Dickens approved of the novel, but it was no match for a woman in white, and in my view is several hundred pages too long. It lasted for 45 instalments. The long chapters in Aldebra, uh, shown in the picture in the middle there, uh, might make you think global warming is a good idea. Henry James once said, think we need a notebook and, and an index to read Collins novels. And they do tend to be both convoluted in their plotting as well as ingenious. The same could equally be said of his next novel, Armadale, his longest, 818 pages in my edition, compared to 741 for No Name and 643 for The Woman in White, which was published in the prestigious Cornell magazine in 20 weekly installments from November 1864 to June 1866. It is notoriously overplotted. The story begins in Bad Feldbad in Germany, a spa town that Collins had visited. A new arrival is asked to transcribe the deathbed confession of an Englishman who has also just arrived. We learn that he had murdered a man who had stolen his name and married the woman he loved. He does this by locking him in his cabin in a shipwreck so that he drowns. When the story shifts to the next generation, we have two characters called Alan Armadale and a femme fatale with flame red hair called Lydia Gwilt. She dominates the action from her first appearance, 300 pages into the plot until the end. In their review of Armadale in The Spectator, the review describes her as a, a woman fouler than the refuse of the streets, who has lived to the ripe old age of 35 and through the horrors of forgery, murder, theft, bigamy, jail, and attempted suicide without any trace of being left of her beauty. What's not to like? Well, it is overcomplicated in its plot, and perhaps, like no name, about 300 pages too long. But it does contain a unique take on the redhead beauty of the pre-Raphaelite's imagination and some interesting moments of suspense. The fourth, and I would argue the best of these novels, is The Moonstone. It's also the shortest of the four, at 457 pages. Like The Woman in White and No Name, this 1868 novel was first serialised in all the year round between January and August, soon to be followed by its publication in volume form 
and within 10 years, like the woman in white by its dramatization. As with the woman in white, Concert adopted a multi voiced narrative. The moonstone of the title, like the Koh i Noor diamond seen here, as worn by Queen Victoria, uh, I think the one on the left is actually the Hope Diamond, by the way, and seen by millions of Britons who had visited the Great Exp uh, Exhibition in 1851 handed over to the East India Company following the conquest of the Punjab. It's in the novel stolen from Tipu Sultan's fort at Mysore after the Battle of Seringapatam in 1799. And like the koh i -Noor, was reputed to carry a curse. The precious diamond is given as an 18th birthday present to a wealthy heiress, Rachel Verinda, and is subsequently stolen. The novel relates in a series of different voices the story of its theft and the unfolding mystery which surrounds this. The topaz which adorns the Russian imperial scepter, uh, the uh, uh, Olaf diamonds, was once the eye of an Indian, Indian god, and so was another inspiration. It's a novel with plenty of humour, pathos and suspense, and a gallery of interesting characters. From the butler, Gabriel Betheridge, who is obsessed with Robinson Crusoe, uh, to the police detective, Sergeant Cuff, who is equally obsessed with Rose Gardens, to the second housemaid, a reformed criminal, who is obsessed with the dashing Franklin Blake, to the unmarried spinster, Miss Lucilla Clack, great name, who is obsessed with biblical tracts. We have a host of characters who hold our interest. There's even a sympathetic mixed race character, Ezra Jennings, who shares Colin's addiction to opium and the inevitable nightmares that accompany that ad addiction. And the villainous but supposedly respectable philanthropist who turns out to be living a double life and keeping a mistress, just like Collins and Dickens were doing at that time. Collins gave the novel a contemporary resonance by borrowing details from the plot from the celebrated case of Constance Kent, who had escaped conviction because of her social status and who confessed to the murder of her brother five years later and three years before the publication of The Moonstone. And here is Rosanna Spearman, the chief suspect, who could have stepped out of the Urania, Dickens' Shepherd's Bush home for fallen women, top left. And she's the chief suspect. She is just one of the many outsiders and outcasts in, in his novels who are branded inferior by reason of class, race, gender, physical handicap, or unusual appearance, but for whom Collins had an inherent sympathy. As well then as the father of the sensation novel, Collins has also been credited as the first to introduce those common tropes we now associate with the classic detective, more accurately, detection novel. The country house mystery, the bloodstained nitrous, the easily duped local policeman, the sharp detective, the parading of suspects, and in this case, the butler, the former thief, the troop of itinerant Indian musicians who may or may not have committed the crime. The Shivering Sands are also no doubt the forerunner of Common Doors, Grimp and Meyer. I'll let you read it and find out for yourself what happens there and who done it. Edgar Allan Poe's short story, The Murders in the Rue Morgue, published in 1841, and Bleak House in 1852, with Inspector Bucket playing a significant role in solving the mystery, may have got there before Collins, but it was he who put all of these elements together. T.S. Eliot described the Moonstone as the first, the longest, and the best of modern de detective novels. And Dorothy L. Sayers described it as probably the finest detective story ever written. You may disagree with their verdicts, but you cannot dispute that Rocky Collins had a significant place in the birth of the genre. This was perhaps achieved almost accidentally as he attempted to break away from the sensation novel and introduce more domestic elements, such as those found in the novel Trollope. So, what has Wilkie Collins ever done for us? Well, as well as the four novels I mentioned, if he'd only written The Moonstone, it would have been remembered, I think. He gave us both the sensation novel and the detective story, which is a branch of it. He was an advocate of the democratisation of reading through publishing novels in cheap editions. He'll be remembered also for exposing the hypocrisy and double dealing beneath the facade of Victorian responsibility for letting us into the Victorian living room with all its hidden secrets, as in this 1862 painting by Robert Martineau, 
for his defense of the underdog and his sympathetic characters, for his bohemian lifestyle, which despite his rejection of the institution of marriage, showed a kindness to two women, to his children and to his grandchildren. Carrie's three girls also accompanied them on their holidays to Ramsgate. According to Peter Ackroyd, his biographer, he was a charmer, befriended by the great, loved by children, irresistibly attractive to women, and the sweetest tempered of all Victorian novelists. And finally, he'll be remembered as the storyteller who's been read by generations of readers and who popularized the phrase ascribed to Charles Reed as a manifesto for the Victorian novel, for any novel, in fact. Make him laugh, make him cry, make him wait. If some of his great baggy monsters make him wait a little too long, there's still more than enough humour, pathos and suspense to satisfy the modern as well as the Victorian reader. He was more than Dickens ampersand. Very truly yours, Wilkie Collins of London, and I shall leave you with that. Thank you.